Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you and to provide a bit of an introduction for our guest today, Marcelo Gorman. Professor Gorman has been spending time with us here at ASU as a Lincoln Center visiting scholar. And we're super grateful for the time we've been able to spend with you and the talk that you're going to give to us this afternoon. Uh, you can see on the slide behind me, Professor Gorman's um, titles, University Research Chair at Waterloo, Professor of English, Director of the Critical Media Lab. Um, he's an extraordinary scholar by any measure, a major contributor to his field. His book, Necromedia, in particular, is a watershed book. And yet, one of the reasons I'm so excited to introduce this talk today is because Professor O'Gorman is also one of these few academics who has managed to go rogue, walk out of the classroom, out of the office, out of the library, and off the campus, or at least across the campus, to find collaborators in arts and engineering to begin to take the theoretical work that he's done and to put it into practice through the creation of material objects and arts that can be let loose in the world and something happens and we learn something from the way in which that something gets let loose. For us at the Lincoln Center, um, we do quite a bit of work around ethical innovation and are particularly interested in these experiments in action-oriented research, if you will, of making something, starting a conversation, letting something loose, and seeing what happens. So with that, I'd like to invite um, Professor O'Gorman to come um, share with us about not only responsible innovation, which is a term you hear sometimes around a place like a university campus, but responsible innovation in relationship to critical design and what happens when those two get brought together. Professor O'Gorman. Thanks. Hand that off. All right, thank you, Gaiman. That was a very generous introduction. I uh, appreciate that very much. And it's been a pleasure to be here, hosted by the Lincoln Center. Everyone's been super gracious. It made me feel at home. Um, and the people at Digital Arts Ranch, um, Center for Philosophical Technology as well, have been super generous too, let us use their space. So thank you to you and Elizabeth and Adam and Stacy. Okay, um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start with a video actually to get, to get things going um, and we'll just uh, we'll take it from there. Just like any mobile device these days, has cameras and sensors, and just like your phones and social media apps, it does facial recognition. Inside here is three grams of shaped explosive. This is how it works. Did you see that? Okay, it's probably enough of that. I, I know so when I usually show this to people, they they say, "Oh, that's that's terrifying." And I, I look at it now, I kind of laugh, but I think that's okay. Um, this is a video of 2015 put out by the Future of Life Institute. I am not advocating for this institute. Um, I really don't know too much about it and don't want to. I uh, guess the question for me would be life, life for whom, um, and whose future. But the point is. I like to show this video because this is a, it's, it's a speculative future. It's based kind of science fictional. This thing does not exist as far as we know. It certainly could exist. You can imagine it existing. It's very easy to put these pieces together. Someone who's not even in STEM disciplines could imagine something like this just by looking at existing technologies, which is how speculative fiction writers do their work all the time. Um, but, you know, so that, this is kind of like one end of what people engaging in responsible innovation theories are concerned about is this kind of these existential threats. I don't really like using that term because I prefer French existentialist threats, but that's something else. 
And at the other end of the spe spectrum, you have something like this, uh, Chris Nodder's book, Evil by Design, which is a design for UI, for UX people, UX designers. Um, he put out this book, one uh, for every sin, every, um, basically every sin from lust to sloth to envy, he has a design proposal and a design comp uh, component to teach you how to get people hooked to your interfaces. And he writes in his introduction, so evil design is that which creates purposefully designed interfaces that make users emotionally involved in doing something that benefits the designer more than them. Sorry about the typo there. So, you know, he has these charts. This one is about pride and how to appeal to people's pride. Uh, and so he has a chapter, how to appeal to people's lust and how to create your design or your entire web interface to appeal or your, your social media platform to appeal to people's uh, sins, basically. And then you have, along with that, you probably may have heard this idea of dark patterns, which is a design concept. My favorite one is privacy zuckering, uh, which people don't, you don't really hear this in the street, but I wish you did. Um, you're tricked into publicly sharing more information about yourself than you really intended to, named after Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. So these are very, this is a very broad spectrum of stuff that people are concerned about today regarding tech, critical approaches to tech, and responsible innovation. Um, and I like, the reason I, I really like the word zuckering is because language is such an important part of all of this. It, if, you know, if we can have words like this that enter into our everyday discourse, it gives us a way of talking about these things and it gives us a way of empowering students, which I like to think about the most, um, to talk about these kinds of issues in a way that everyone recognizes and to put a name to them. So I'm going to skip that slide quickly. So I've been, I've been doing work in this area for quite a while. In 2017, I worked with Deloitte and Communitech uh, in, in Canada on the Canadian Tech for Good Declaration. And these tenets, build trust and respect your data, be transparent and give choice, reskill the future of work, leave no one behind, think inclusively at every stage, and actively participate in collaborative governance. And you can ask me about these later if you're interested. We came up with these as something that tech companies would sign on to and make a pledge, and they would have a public pledge on this website and say, you know, we are a tech for good company. The question is, you know, there's nothing stopping someone from printing this declaration up and sticking it on their cubicle wall or on the CEO's wall in, or any C-suite individual's wall and not really doing anything about it. There's a glut of similar declarations and manifestos. You can find them online, you know, AI for good and responsible AI and all that stuff. And so the term responsible innovation for me, I've kind of landed on it um, and we could talk about that nomenclature and why responsible, why not ethical, but um, I've landed on it because ethical, when I've used it in the past, has really hit the wall with a lot of analytic philosophers uh, who are basically saying, well, that's not, this, is, this has nothing to do with ethics, what you're doing, it's something else, so um, chose not to deal with them. Now the Lincoln Center, of course, uses this term, and they also use the, the idea of humane technology, and so over the past three weeks we've been discussing, again, humane, human, human according to whom. Um, and this is, a you know, Ruha Benjamin in her book Race Against Technology says, you know, you could say humane technology, but my people weren't considered human until in the United States until about 50 years ago. And so who is your model for a human and who is this for? All right. So responsible innovation, the reason I chose this topic bless you, is Canada just put out a, in, just in 2021, a responsible innovation document, which actually is, is to me, it's, it sets a standard for, I'm not saying just because it's Canadian, I'm Canadian, but it sets a standard for these kinds of declarations because of the, primarily because of the language that it use, uses. And I'm sure that there were definitely some STS philosophy people um, working on this with them. So. Their tenets are anticipation, <laughs> bless you, proactively mitigating adverse effects, inclusion and diversity at all stages of a technology's life cycle. So when I teach this stuff to students, that means not just thinking about who's on your uh, design team, which is important and what their biases might be, but also 
who might your product or service be excluding? Who is it meant for? And how far out can you project that? How inclusive can you be with it? Justice and fairness, so understanding and reversing disproportionate impacts, power imbalances, and systemic effects. And this is this kind of language. This is stuff right out of you know contemporary cultural studies, um, social uh, social science, social justice studies. This idea of understanding and re not just thinking about the impacts of your technology, but understanding and reversing disproportionate impacts, power imbalances. So reversing power imbalances through your design product, that's something that I think not, not, not a lot of people think about during their workflow. And then interdisciplinarity and collaboration across many domains. Self-awareness or reflexivity. So, you know, there's, a, there's some, again, know thyself. There's something happening here of one's own position and perspective. An agency and choice for those using or impacted by a technology. This is a lot to ask of, of designers. And I, I teach this to engineering students, and they're like, how, what, is, how, what is this? I can't, what is all this? I can't do all this. Of course, it depends on which engineering program, which discipline, sub-discipline of engineering you're talking about. Software engineering is notoriously difficult to deal with. We have an expression. I heard it from students this week. I was guest lecturing in a class. The students say, you know, we get software engineers, we get to University of Waterloo, and the motto is Cali or bust. We have a very aggressive uh, co-op program, and these students are basically saying, I'm going to get to Silicon Valley. I'm going to get that job working, you know, my one semester, well, they work four or five semesters of co-op, maybe, you know, what, $80,000 a semester or something like that, um, depending on the position they get. So this is responsible innovation, and that's why I'm using that term today. Now, here are some key issues of responsible innovation. I may be telling, I don't, I don't know who's actually out there watching this or who will, but here are some key issues. When I teach this to students, um, these, are the, these are the kinds of key terms that I use with them to give them some language to talk about key issues. So algorithmic bias, conflict minerals, e-waste, automation, data privacy, and the last one, captology, which is my personal favorite. So algorithmic bias, you know, most of you know this already. Um, it's not so much, you know, the issue of the algorithms are doing something bad or something evil, but the data sets themselves are, can be very problematic. The data sets that the algorithms are accessing and using to draw conclusions or to, pre and to present results are problematic. So you have Safia Noble typing in, this is how her book really was inspired, um, she's with her, with her niece and she types in why are black women so into the Google search bar and the auto suggest for that is all of this stuff that you see on the book here you can probably see angry loud mean attractive lazy annoying and so the question is again human according to, to, to who uh, black woman according to whom and this is where the idea of algorithmic bias comes in is it is it intentional we'd like to say no, it's based on implicit biases that the designers have. Um, and then we have to look at the demographics of designers and who's going into software design and so on. Noble says, where men shape technology, they shape it to the exclusion of women, especially black women. So taking um, a very hard line on this, obviously. And so this is the issue as we saw in the, in the um, you know, everyone's talking about and everyone is taking responsibility for at universities as well, of course, of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And now all of our students are required to understand this, do modules in this if they're in engineering and so on. Um, it's just part of what they do. But the question is just how far, how far does this go and what is really its impact? And you have someone like uh, queer theory scholar Sarah Ahmed in her book, What's the Use? talking about her own diversity position at her university and why she left it and why she left academia altogether uh, because of the kinds of lip service that can be played to these, paid to these things and also because of the kinds of tokenism that go on in, that can go on in these sorts of programs. I'm not saying that EDI programs are bad. I'm saying, again, um, these are all issues we're contending with right now and, and have to deal with, and it's extremely complex, as you're aware. Conflict minerals, I usually do this interactively 
you know, people say, what, you know, what do you think conflict minerals are? So I, I mean, I could ask the audience, but you know, people aren't really miked. I don't know if that will work, but conflict minerals, if you're interested, there's a really good, there was a really good expose in The Guardian a couple years ago um, about this. And the issue is basically minerals uh, like tungsten, cobalt, uh, coltan, et cetera, that are extracted from precarious regions uh, in the Congo, for example, is probably the most famous example, uh, where those minerals are extremely valuable, used in the pr production of semiconductors and batteries and microprocessors. And they're basically, the, the mines are guarded by, warlord, by warlords, and the money goes to fund the purchase of weapons to support war activity in these countries. So you have, you know, consumers don't know the electronic devices are made of conflict minerals. Manufacturers need to comply with conflict mineral regulations to sell their products in the United States and the European Union. But you, you don't, you know, and at the other, at the far end of this cycle, warlords, rebels, armies, and other actors buy weapons and fund their atrocities with the profits of the trade. So although there are regulations, you can't always trace the exact source of your semiconductor, the minerals in your semiconductor. And so even if you wanted to create a, a responsible small hardware project, the, tra tracing the source of the minerals in your parts, good luck. Uh, extremely difficult, obviously, but nay impossible to do that. E-waste, which is, you know, we think, when we think of e-waste, we think of this. People with, you know, um, just getting rid of their stuff or putting it by the side of the road, their old CRT monitor or their old Pentium 3. Or people, like I say people, but I am also complicit in this. Two old phones in a drawer somewhere in the house because you don't want to go through the trouble of taking everything off of them or you're emotionally connected to it or something. Um, and those phones just sit there and you know who knows where they will end up. But this is more about other kinds of issues like the more invisible issues related to, to Bitcoin and the carbon footprint footprint of Bitcoin. You may have heard of this. There's a great story. There's a French, a French artist who's actually an environmental activist and he created a, a video NFT. Um, it's basically just some polygonal figures and he created his first NFT. He sold it for, he made around $16,000, which isn't huge for an NFT. And he realized after doing it that he traced the carbon, and there are calculators to do this, the carbon footprint of his NFT and realized he could have powered his studio for a full year based on the amount of carbon that he expended just for this one one-off NFT. So there are these kinds of invisible elements that we have to think about. When I'm, I, I teach students or I direct their design projects in engineering, and it's like, well, we developed this app to help people reduce their carbon footprint. And you know, what is the, and the first question is, well, what is the app running on? What kind of resources does it draw on? And can you think about that? And can you actually use that to instruct the people using the app about those issues as well? And then automation, you know, the first thing we talk about automation, it's a very industrial uh, era kind of concern. Uh, well, pre-industrial actually, but, um, you think about, you might think about things like uh, job automation, robots in the factory, and so on. But we also have to think about, of course, the, the little uh, food robots that roam around this campus. And uh, Ron's always saying, well, those are, you know, those robots are learning how to be military robots. And they're at training, they're being trained to go out into the field like this, um, this uh, Boston, Boston uh, robotics dog here on the left hand side, which is kind of funny. And then you have Microsoft's Tay that Microsoft created this AI chat bot and within 24 hours it was incredibly racist and misogynistic. And it's the same question as algorithmic bias. Like what was the chat bot being trained on? It was being trained on what is already on the internet and what is already, um, uh, sorry, on social media and on Twitter and so on. So. I know I'm going through all this stuff, but I think, I mean, <laughs> the point of this is to think about language and to think about how we, the kinds of language we developed around this that exists now that didn't exist even five years ago. You talk about algorithmic bias to someone five years ago, they probably wouldn't have a clue 
what you were talking about. So it's good that these th these these um, words are entering our uh, our vocabularies. Real concerns about algorithmic bias, though, or sorry, about automation, as with everything else, is tying it to uh, to demographics and to look at which jobs, for example, um, from this McKinsey report, are, are most likely to be automated in the short term. And you see a combination of food services way up there, manufacturing, transportation, warehousing, um, educational services, you could see, which is really interesting, even post-COVID, less likely to be automated. And, but you can look at this and you can basically chart onto this uh, a demographic sort of visualization of, well, who, who are these people? Who are the people who are most likely to lose their jobs to automation? And where do those people go? So there's a lot of talk about the future of work, retraining, reskilling, all that stuff. You know, there's a huge company out of Waterloo called Exonify that is all about micro-learning, uh, micro-learning apps for people. So that on the job, they can have a little gamified micro-learning um, micro learning session to learn how to upskill so they can move up, move up the ladder or, or whatever it might be. Um, but these are, not, these are not things that the people creating the automated industrial uh, machinery are necessarily, they're not thinking about this. And we, do, we can't separate any of these issues from the identities and from the demographics and the finances in which they're embedded. And I guess that's the biggest point. Data privacy, you know, healthcare is a huge issue here, and um, you know, I, I won't say too much about that because I'm Canadian. We have socialized medicine, and I'm not going to say anything about the U.S. The U.S. You know, medicine, um, but also just you know the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal and how that went down and how it's still going down with data brokers with people willingly offering up their their data and not knowing it and not knowing where it's going. Uh, and I know this sounds very, everybody's like, yeah, we, we know that. We all know that. We all know this. A lot of what I'm doing here, again, is these, I, I present these things to students and they kind of have, a lot of them have no idea this is happening. Or more interestingly, they don't care. Uh, or they do care and they also want to capitalize on it because, because there's money in it. Um, so there's that. Uh, speaking of which, as I said, this is my favorite. It's captology. And has anyone here heard of this term before? I don't know. Yeah, OK. So captology is um, computers as persuasive technology. It's a term coined by BJ Fogg at the Stanford Computers as Persu Pers Persuasive Technology Lab. And B.J. Fogg, this is from one of his articles, this graphic, which is obviously dated because CD-ROM is right there in the center on the one side. But uh, B.J. Fogg is not a, he's not an engineer, he's not a designer. This is really, a, these are really rhetorical theories that he's drawing on to look at, um, to look at human behavior, so behaviorism. Things like uh, deferred, deferred pleasure and randomized pleasure and um, the use of colors that appeal to us on an evolutionary or atavistic scale that will make us respond, or sounds that will make us respond in ways that are essentially, um, essentially drawing on our vulnerabilities and capitalizing on our vulnerabilities to draw our attention, to capture our attention, and um, keep us on, a, on, a, on an app longer, for example, or keep us coming back. You could think of the... Um, What's his name? Brick, Brichter. Lauren Brichter invented the pull to refresh. You know that pull to refresh? On, it's on Twitter. It's on several apps. He invented this movement, basically. And uh, it's there just simply to get people to, to keep checking. Um, and that's, he, he admits this. He actually left Twitter. And now he's since one of the many confessors of digital sins, like Tristan Harris and Chamath Palliopidia, um, who have worked at these companies made a whole lot of money and then said, I'm not doing this anymore. These companies are evil. So if you're interested in that, I wrote an article about that in the Globe and Mail called The Reckoning, Silicon Valley Confronts Its Digital Sins, about the kind of moral guilt load that some of these uh, Silicon Valley superstars are now feeling and the confessions they're making. 
And then, you know, the, what are they, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem, again, has to do with capitalizing on the vulnerability of others. So a good place to look for this, if you're interested in this, is in its impact on, on youth. And there's some really good, uh, more solid research coming out here now that isn't blaming youth and calling them the I generation and so on, but basically saying, you know, these are behavioral patterns that we're seeing that youth are engaging in, the apps are facilitating these patterns, and then essentially cycling them at very high speeds and uh, at, you know, a very in a ubiquitous way. It's very difficult to get out of. And so this graph here basically just shows the extent to which Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, and Twitter impact various, uh, ish, various components of well-being and health, such as sleep, fear, uh, fear of missing out, bullying, body image, anxiety, et cetera. So there you go. Now, this is a really kind of a dunce of a question, but why, why do these things happen? I guess you could just say, Capitalism is the answer, and that would be, that's it, and it's done, and we can all go home. Um, but if you're you know, working with uh, design students, engineering students who are working in this area, you've got to have a better answer than capitalism, because they love capitalism, and as most, you know, a lot of people do, and what are you going to do about, how are you going to solve that problem? It's not, money's not bad, um, it's just the way that people are making it, right? Speaking of pedestrian statements, so I, you know, when I answer this question, I turn to a very unlikely text, which is Critical Design in Context by Matt Malpass. <laughs> That's not probably where you would expect someone to go. But Malpass says, in thinking about the history of this tradition of critical design, and he, he elaborates on a whole list of designers who he considers critical designers and a history of them. And there's a lot of discussion and argument about this, but so the common approach in the technocentric domain of product design is for the designer and technologist to focus on what technology can do and to often ignore the contextual issues that can turn a technology into a product and in turn modify the human experience of that technology. So this is, it's all about, it's all about context. And this is what people in social sciences and humanities and arts have to offer people in STEM who are doing this kind of design work. Is because that's what we do, is look at context. That's essentially, it's kind of what we do, is broaden the context, is look at an issue and then explode it into its various contexts, whether it's social context, environmental context, and so on. So critical design, and Malpass says this, is not solving problems. It's about finding problems. And it's kind of fun when you tell the students, you know, this class is about problem finding, and you're all going to be problem finders by the end of this term. And I mean, who really wants to hang out with a problem finder? Probably nobody. But the issue there is that as a po it's basically running counter to the techno fix, problem solving mentality of uh, other design disciplines where it's like, we're going to fix this thing. Were this a problem? We're going to fix it. And to do that, even just to say that, I mean, try that in a relationship. If someone says, I'm having this problem, and, and instead of acknowledging the problem that they're having and maybe providing some context, you say, oh, yeah, we can fix that problem. I'll fix that problem. It doesn't, doesn't always work so well um, because, it's because, uh, because of context, because, you know, it's just ridiculous. Uh, so finding problems is the issue there. You see this. You know, if you haven't really heard or thought about critical design, you may have seen the show Black Mirror. And Black Mirror, I would say, is a, it's a critical design show uh, par excellence. And you even have what I, what I would point to especially are the props that are used in Black Mirror. So this is a prop. This is a young child having a brain implant uh, injected into her head so that her helicopter mother can constantly track all of her vitals and see what she's seeing and can always you know, watch over her. And again, it's the props that are interesting. This is basically you know, a rejigged iPad with a, with a, a janky kind of uh, UA, UI or UX interface. And who knows what this needle thing is that's going into the child's head. But these kinds of props, even just designing these props and thinking about these props and what they do, to me, offer opportunities for reflecting on uh, these responsible innovation issues. 
And you can see Black Mirror, even the title of the show, is uh, it's dystopian. And in their book, you know, this is like uh, Dunn and Raby, Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby, kind of, they, they claim they coined the term critical design. Um, they really are more famous for the term speculative design. And they talk about dark design as well. Darkness as an antidote to naive techno-utopianism that can jolt people into action. It's more about the positive use of negativity, not negativity for its own sake, but to draw attention to a scary possibility in the form of a cautionary tale. So just as speculative fiction would provide cautionary tales through fiction, through a novel, for example, speculative design can do the same thing through design artifacts. And the whole point of this is to create spaces for discussion and debate. It's not about solving problems. It's not about entertaining people like Black Mirror is. It's about having people engage, you know, expose people to a, a, an object to have them engage in discussion. More recently, um, Bruce and Stephanie Tharp wrote the book um, Discursive Design, which actually is a, a term that I like a lot because Discursive design is about creating design artifacts meant to generate discourse and based on critical discourse. Um, so I think that that's really a way of thinking about this. And for students in the arts and humanities who engage in these practices, I basically say you, you're writing an essay, instead of writing the essay to critique the thing, you make a thing that critiques the thing you want to critique. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later. You don't, when you're working with English students who have no background in arts or design, you end up with a lot of interesting results. But critical design methods are often like this, fictional worlds, utopias, dystopias, thought experiments, objects to think with, and what ifs. And we have to draw a line here between, and Matt Malpass does in his book, critical design and art. Wasn't it just art? One big critique of critical design is its tendency toward elitism. The idea that, you know, same, same critique of the Frankfurt School, um, you know, you're the, you're the uh, elite intellectual person designing this thing to teach us a lesson about something, and that can be very problematic. Or if you're creating these design objects to show them in a, in a gallery, for example, obviously problematic. So there are ways of correcting for this, obviously through, through co-design, through seeking out new contexts for your design interventions, and so on. It's this, for that reason that my lab is not on campus. It's actually in the Communitech Hub, which is a tech incubator and tech um, accelerator center and so on. Uh, Google has a presence there and Rogers and um, all these different companies. So, and, But we're also very close to the arts community in downtown Kitchener near Waterloo. And those are very different contexts for us to be working in. So you can look at something like Mimi Onuoha's work, um, the library of missing data sets, for example. So Onuoha has this installation. It's just a file folder uh, or a filing cabinet. It can go through and pull out the folders, and there are all these missing, all the data that's missing primarily because of power asymmetries that does not collect data on certain demographics of people. But again, this is designed, it's, dis it's displayed in, in galleries and museums. So you could say, well, is this critical design? Um, the intent here certainly is critical, like a lot of art is. But is it critical design? I don't, it depends, again, on the context, where you're presenting it, and who you're involving in the creation of these things. And then David Mellis's uh, well-known DIY cell phone, which was not something designed to be to be shown in a gallery. It was something designed to get people to think about the, the um, first of all, the disposability of their devices and the, the lack of renewable devices that we have access to. So this brings up something like the right to repair movement, which is much huger in Europe than it is here, but um, super problematic here. Your iPhone battery dies, you gotta you basically get rid of it. You, you can't open it up and replace that battery. I had an experience just recently before coming here. I had this, uh, like a Braun coffee maker, a drip coffee maker. And I got it, it's an expensive coffee maker for a drip coffee maker. I got it with air miles, don't, don't ask. That were like legacy air miles, I found this card. And it, it, within a month, one of the little LCD lines on the interface disappeared. And so I called the company, I finally got through, and I said, you know, I'd like to 
this is a you know fairly expensive thing. I'd like to replace that screen. And they said, well, that screen is soldered to the board. We can't, we can't really re have you replace it. We don't want people going into our electronics. So what we need you to do is cut the cord at the back of the coffee maker, send us a picture of the cut cord and of the back of the coffee maker, discard the, the appliance, and we'll send you a new one. <laughs> it's, it's one little lot. I mean, maybe it's my problem for complaining about it, but really, you can't just take that screen out and replace it. Or you can't you know, send this back or give this coffee maker to someone who might really appreciate it, even with the one line gone. Um, needless to say, I didn't, I didn't cut the cord. So these issues, these critical design issues, I teach in a graduate course, University of Waterloo, called Critical Design Methods. Um, soon to be cross-listed with our systems design engineering program. So the idea here is to get, these are English students in this course, but they come to our department specifically to study uh, in a, a master's program called Experimental Digital Media. And then we have PhD students who also study, uh, who study you know, technocritical studies, uh, whatever you might want to call it, who don't necessarily have backgrounds in English, but are coming to us from science and technology studies and so on. But the idea here is to get engineering students and these arts and social science students together in the design, uh, in the design lab, in the design process, working on these projects. This is already happening in an ad hoc way in my lab, but the course actually puts this, uh, puts this into action in the curriculum, makes it part of the curriculum, to ensure that this kind of activity and interaction across uh, STEM and arts disciplines is happening. So what kind of projects do these students produce? Um, the cover of my, of my latest book, there's this basket I'm showing here, made by Caitlin Woodcock. And Caitlin was very interested in domestic crafts and in the kind of uh, cognitive benefits, the affective and emotional benefits of engaging in craft work, and also in the kind of gendering of handicraft. So she wanted, she wove this basket by hand and then she put a, um, basically a small Arduino microcontroller in the bottom with a force sensor in the bottom as well and this LCD screen. And when you put your, it says rest your phone. When you put your phone in, it starts adding up the number of seconds that your phone is in the basket. So it's, it's a way for people to rest their phone somewhere. When you take your phone out, it tells you what percentage of that basket you could have woven because your hands were free of your phone. So the idea there, and this is connected to you know, in her, in her thesis to philosophical issues about human evolution and hands and the upright stance of humans and its relationship to technology and so on. But it's also about thinking about the gendered nature of handiwork. And so she wanted to do a project that combined domestic craft and hardware hacking at the same time. And uh, this is what she ended up with. This, this basket actually ended up in the office of our the university president for a while. Um, which is fun. He, addicted to, he, 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 he confessed to me that he, was, he had been addicted to his Blackberry and he wanted to have the basket in his office. Um, but he said he recovered, so there you go. Not because of the basket, but yeah. Other projects uh, from the lab, uh, I, I have students in, um, I've done this a few times, have them make a pinhole camera out of a coffee can they paint the, the inside black if you've never made one. Um, and then you put photosensitive paper in the coffee can and you open up a small aperture where a pinhole is and you take a photo. But you don't know, you can't see inside the black box. So you don't know how quickly the photo, is, the photo paper is being exposed. You don't know how long to stay in front of it if you're trying to take a selfie. It's this incredibly tenuous um, you know, process, uh, of obfuscatory process. And it uh, gets students to think about phenomenology, to think about time in relationship to technology, to think about efficiency, to think about uh, photographic, photographic excess and the gaze and all this other stuff through a project that they make. And to, think, to have them think about, you know, to have them engage in acts of care with technology that they wouldn't normally have opportunities to engage in. So they also learn how to, um, how to uh, develop the film in a dark room, which is a very different relationship to tech for a lot of these students. And it, it's meant 
to be a way of forming relationships of care to technology as opposed to disposability and so on. As a student developed this in that, in that course I was just showing you um, this past fall, James Velichka, this is the police shooting decision maker. And it's a box, you may have seen this before, a useless box where, um, and there's a, there's a history for this uh, that, I, that I won't get into, you can ask me if you like, but uh, where you press a button on the box and a little finger comes out and just turns the button off and that's all the box does. Uh, the ultimate machine, Claude Shannon called it. And he basically used this, he added four more buttons to the box and those buttons say um, previous criminal history, income, violent act, bad neighborhood, and then the middle one is black. The only button that works on the box is the one that says black. And he's using this, he's actually doing statistical work in, um, uh, in he's a uh, sociology student doing statistical work on, on shoot, police shootings. And this, I mean, this information is out there quite freely. Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, goes over this sort of thing as well. But the point here is that he wanted to embody this, had an opportunity to embody this in a physical object. And something that he can take and just show to someone and use this as an object to think with to explain what this means statistically. So a lot of this stuff, and you're, you know, you might be looking at these projects saying, well, these aren't really art, these aren't art students. I like to call these projects crap entry. I call my own projects crap entry. Um, I do this because I don't, I don't, this, I don't like the students to think that they're, they're designers. I don't, you know, they can if they want, I don't care, but I don't call them designers. I don't call their work art. Um, and I, the same way with my own projects, I, I generally don't do that. So crap and tree kind of eases their anxiety because then they don't feel like they have to create this aesthetically beautiful project or this uh, incredibly efficient hardware, hardware thing. It basically eases their mind, but it's also a de-disciplinary move to get them to think outside of, uh, outside of roles of mastery, so mastery over some kind of domain, like, like carpentry, for example. But then it ultimately is a form of attention formation, to get these students to use their attention in ways that they're usually not used to, to play with time, to play with focus, to play with hand-eye coordination in ways that offers opportunities for different kinds of reflection and critical reflection. So this is, a, this is the wall of text you're never supposed to do in a slide deck, and I'm sorry, I have two of them. But I just want to point out a lot of this talk that I'm giving is really about pedagogy, and it's about these, you know, these oh, responsible innovation topics a lot of people know about. But where all of this is really coming from for me is from media theory and the philosophy of technology. And there are two key texts here that really inspired my last book, Making Media Theory. And this one's from uh, Isabel Stenger's In Catastrophic Times. You can download this for free from Open University Press, a good little book. So she talks about making, uh, what, we've, what we've been ordered to forget is not the capacity to pay attention, but the art of paying attention. If there is an art and not just a capacity, this is because it's a matter of learning and cultivating, that is to say, making ourselves pay attention. And in French, if you read the French version, and there's a note here the, that the translator puts in, Stengers is actually saying, faire, faire attention, faire attention, um, which in French, if you translate it literally, it means make attention. I'll get to that in a minute. Making in the sense that attention here is not related to that which is defined as a priori worthy of attention, but is something that creates an obligation to imagine, to check, to envisage consequences that bring into play connections between what we are in the habit of keeping separate. And no, okay, this is philosophy, I'm reading this wall of text, but the whole idea here is that attention is related to freedom. And what you do with your attention, and how your ability to control your attention, and your ability to understand where your attention is going, um, is related to your own personal freedom. There is a complication here when you get into, you could have a critical disability study approach to this concept, and think about people with different modalities of attention, people who aren't normies. And so if you say, well, you need to pay attention differently, they're like, I already pay attention differently. The point here is not about a specific kind of attention, like hyper versus deep attention, but about thinking about attention in terms of capital and then having people understand that and then using their attention for different kinds of reflective practices beyond the, one, beyond the ones offered to them 
by consumerism. Quite simple. And then the other one, uh, this other quote comes from Bernard Stiegler. Um, and he talks about, in his book, Taking Care, Volume 1, There's No Volume 2, the invention of a new way of life that takes care of and pays attention to the world by inventing techniques, technologies, and social structures of attention formation corresponding to the organolog organological specificities of our time. So the idea here, ultimately in this book, and Stiegler says it in this book, is to create counter technologies that counter the, the techniques that are being used to capture attention um, for consumer purposes or for persuasive political purposes, quite frankly. And so paying attention, you know, to what your attention is doing is incredibly, uh, is incredibly important. And we say in English, pay attention, which is unfortunate because the idea of paying attention uh, involves, it seems to involve some sort of transaction. You're paying something. Um, so there's a, there's a notion of, of, of capital here. Whereas in French, faites attention, it means something kind of different. Uh, it quite literally means make attention. And I like this idea of attention being something deliberate that you create, that you generate, and so on. And that term also means be careful. So the notions of care, attention formation, um, these are all kind of philosophically what's behind these projects that I'm teaching these students that are involved in responsible innovation. And these are the kinds of things I'm trying to transmit to STEM students through um, responsible innovation courses and critical design methods. So I'll finish off, I, because I said I gave this lecture this week to a bunch of engineering students. And the, I was a visiting, just a visiting lecturer, and the instructor said, I said, well, I'm going to talk to them about responsible innovation and critical design. She's like, ah, uh, they probably won't come. <laughs> can, you, can you give me something else? So I gave her three titles. I was like, how to make more money as an engineer by being good. And then I think the last one, what was the last one? How not to be evil as an engineer or something like that. Anyway, it was kind of funny, but I kind of had a sense of who I was going to be talking to. And so what I focused on, and some of you may know about the growth of, of the concept of the ESG. So you might ask what it is. So this is, you could check out this website, look up um, ESG, the report. ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. An ESG score is a measurement of a company's level of sustainability. So you could think of, it uh, takes into account everything from their environmental impact to how they treat their employees in order to establish if they're meeting best practices in these areas. So here is where the, all of those declarations that I mentioned at the beginning get translated into an audit, into an ESG audit that companies can then follow and then they can, they can promote their ESG score. And if you promote that ESG score, you're more likely to get, it being shown now, investors. So, you know, the mantra then becomes tech for good is good for business. And, uh, you know, frankly, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, if, if it's going to, you know, if the only way to get people to sign on to a tech for good ethos is to say it will make you more money, fine. Um, but this is really what speaks to the students, quite frankly. Stieglers, Stiegler and Stengers speak less to the students than talking to them about you know, you need to know about this stuff because it's going to be part of your future career and it's going to be part of what's going to make your company more wealthy. So that's really depressing, uh, maybe. For some people, some people are like, yeah, that's great. I don't know. But that's how I'm going to end my talk. So thank you. I think we have questions happening now. Questions are happening. Thanks so much. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, just a, a question sort of at the top of the talk, which is um, responsible innovation and critical design, you're focusing on the making of objects. And yet, as you talked us through, as it were, the kind of ecology of the tech world and its relationship to um, collective life today, the places where if the evil gets done isn't necessarily the device. It's the processes, institutions, yeah. um, economies within which the devices circulate. I mean, the devices have a lot to do with it, too. Obviously, we wouldn't yeah. have these conversations if the devices 
weren't circulating. Yeah. But I wonder if you've thought about how you do critical design. You mentioned the C-suite earlier. Like, how do you do mm -hmm. critical design for people in these milieu whose job isn't to engineer an object, but who are very much part of the processes that manage products and business models and yeah. auditing systems and so forth? Good question. Um, I, I use design not to say, you need to design this way. I, I use critical design not to say, you need to design this way. I use it to say, let's engage in this process. And engaging in this process provides us an opportunity to reflect and to think about the materiality of the products that are circulating in our environments. That's what it's about. So I, would, I have taught workshops with C-suite executives and startup companies and so on where we do, we, you know, we do critical design projects. We engage in these kinds of, because it's a language that speaks to a lot of these folks that they understand and that they can, they can actually find joy in. And if you can get people to find joy in discussing these issues as opposed to feeling guilt or being you know, shamed or something like that, then I think that that's, that's really important. So yeah, so really, it's, it's really about, it's OK if what you're creating is crap and tree, because it really is about generating that discussion in a way that's materially rich to provide uh, opportunities for reflection. Yeah, thanks, Marcel. Uh, um, so I have uh, sort of a question about sort of the, the transition in your talk, I mean, I think it was really subtle, and I liked it a lot, from the sort of critical design to talking about paying and then making attention. And, you know, it seems to me that there's also a sort of a, sh a kind of um, a way of talking about this shift in terms of it's not simply about making the objects, but we're also ma it, it's about the craft of the self. Yeah. In other words, uh, and, and this brings up something that's challenging for me in the kind of work that I do around the sort of design world is that you know, the speculative and critical designers aren't so interested in talking to people um, that are doing the kind of ontological design. So, um, you know, the, and, and the ontological designers are not so interested in, well, and largely because ontological design is, is mostly an academic discourse as opposed to a making discourse or something. But it seems to me that, you know, what you're doing when you're when you're sort of talking about crappentry and it's about the bringing into being and designing of the of of attention a la stengers and and um stiegler i mean it's hard to see this as not a kind of critical design meets ontological design mm -hmm. um and i just i just want to applaud you <laughs> it's not really a question it's more of a comment because i just think it's really it's really smart because it's very subtle without you sort of like sidestepping a lot of these academic conversations and and really just sort of showcasing how you know these largely speculative projects are about the formation of a self. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I get into that in quite a bit of depth in the book. It's not a big book, but in, I have a chapter on basket making where I talk about that. And I talk about the moment in Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which everyone knows, um, where she's bending, trying to bend this, uh, this, this uh, piece of ash into a basket and it, and it whips back and whips her in the face. <laughs> and at that moment, she has this realization about, um, about becoming, about she is trying to bend the world to her will in a certain way. The world is resisting, it smacks her upside the head and it reminds her of her own mortality, it reminds her of her own materiality in the world and all these kinds of ontological questions that also, I talk about that in the chapter, that these, I don't t necessarily say that to students when I'm talking about this. I mean, they, they might read the book, but I don't say, well, you're crafting yourself here because they're going to think that I'm engaging in some kind of weird ethical, like not even ethical, culty sort of, you know, mind bending. It's not about attention formation. It's about uh, some weird sort of um, mind control <laughs> or something. But... But it is about thinking about your relationship to the material world, your own embodiment, your own, uh, your own kind, even your, like, your own evolutionary kinds of, uh, of, of morphing and so on, and in, in relation to objects. A lot is about relationality and so on. So. But this is, I just want to say, this is like sort of following exactly the conversation. 
conversation that doesn't happen in critical inspective design because no. it's just treated. I mean, look at it, it's still a domain of expertise, and we're producing these objects, and it's only after the fact that we think about, you know, the consequences and so. But it's still at the end of the day, these are objects that are separate from the self. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the thing about that, about thinking about it ontologically in terms of relationality to the objects, um, gets you to think about all objects, your consumer objects differently. It can, and that's kind of the point. So it's not just the basket you're trying to weave or the, the, the circuit that's not working that you're trying to, you know, you, should, you would understand if you're an engineer, but you don't. It's about your relationality to those kinds of objects. And before our next question, I just have to say that uh, director of the Lincoln Center, Elizabeth Langlin, has commented that she absolutely loves the concept of crap and tree. And I think we're, we're going to be using that in the Lincoln Center. So thank Excellent. you. I have a question for you. And that's that so many of the examples that you just presented, um, these, these tech things work because they're convenient or they're good enough. Like Amazon isn't the cheapest. It's not the best quality, but it is the most convenient. Um, so how do we sacrifice that convenience, um, particularly when we're like coming out of this or still involved in this pandemic when we're so reliant on these sort of external like things to get things into our homes and our ourselves? I mean, we're just we're fancy apes with the path of least resistance is the most attractive path to take. Yeah. Um, so how do we how do you hack that evolutionary like approach that that underlies all of this is that if it's convenient, it's something that most people will go after instead of slowing down or shopping locally instead of clicking something on Amazon. Like, how do you address that? Yeah, Eric, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, it's like <laughs> someone asked me at dinner this week, you know, why, why are you so concerned about automation when a lot of the jobs those people are doing are really crappy jobs anyway? And they don't, they're not good jobs and they're not, you know, they're, they're hard and they're dirty and they're, it's like, well, some of that is very true, but you can't, <laughs> you can't dissociate the people and why they're in that job in the first place and what their own current uh, geopolitical circumstances are from the autumn, from the technology. So again, you know, what, what, do we have a revolution and everybody, we, we embargo Amazon. No more Amazon. I do think there's room for that. I think there's room for that, um, to be perfectly honest. I would love to see more of that. But realistically, no, we're going to go for the efficient thing. I think the point is to try to find ways, and I know this is extremely idealistic, but this is where the responsible innovation stuff is all headed. We can have efficiency and we can have responsibility too. How do we do that? How do we head in that direction? And the problem is always that efficiency always comes first. The convenience always comes first and that the other stuff is hard. And the other stuff, you know, even thinking of environmental footprints involved in ordering something from Amazon, uh, you know, which is incredibly difficult to even account for, is, is so hard to, to solve and to think about. And people don't want it because they're afraid it's going to impact their, their convenience. So I, I can't, I, I wish I could answer that question, you know, but I can't. What, you know, I could say, well, maybe this type of thinking will, uh, will encourage moderation for example, it will encourage, you know, people to think more about their consumer habits. And I don't really get into that, but I would like to think that. I don't know. And then I think as we approach the end of our event, I wonder, Dr. O'Gorman, if there is anything that you'd leave for our community at the end of your visit here um, to think about how should we, I mean, you talked a lot about the classroom, so maybe that's a um, how do we bring these things into the classroom here at ASU? Um, what advice do you have for us? I think, I, you know, I'll just leave you with that idea of, a, of attention formation, which is to provide different kinds of opportunities for reflection beyond those that are generally, you know, that are generally advisable in the social sciences and humanities. It could be very difficult when you have large classes, for example, um, but some of our engineering design classes have over 100 students in them. And those still, students still do design projects. You have to rejig the way that you're teaching the stuff. And again, it's not about teaching them how to be designers. It's about using these different kinds of physical modalities for encouraging different ways of thinking. 
So. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Thank you. Thank you, everyone that's watching on the live stream. All right.